Well, let's uh, turn in our Bibles to First John and Chapter Three, and just a forward announcement: this evening I'll be back in the Book of Daniel, and we will be continuing with Daniel. So for for the young at heart, students, and so forth. Uh, this is primarily for you, and I'd like to encourage you not only to come, but also to invite young friends so that you might fill up this place. First John chapter 3, and we will begin with verse 10, although I am preaching from verse 11 this morning. The only reason why I want us to begin with verse 10 in reading is so that we put into context uh, what we are dealing with. So First John and chapter 3, verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Well, that's the passage that we are looking at as we continue in our series of messages on the subject of assurance of eternal salvation. And I'm emphasizing the word eternal there because that's the nature of God's salvation. He doesn't just save us from sin today and we go right back into the life of sin tomorrow. When he saves us, it is a permanent salvation. And consequently, he takes us all the way to heaven. For the last number of weeks, we have been looking at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 down to verse 10. And in that passage of scripture, John was using what I have been calling the moral test. In other words, he has been saying that if you are still living in sin, then you are not a Christian. If you are no longer living in sin, then you are a Christian. Simple and straightforward. In other words, salvation is not something that simply changes our destination, where we will go. Salvation changes our hearts. And when it changes our hearts, it's a moral change. Before Jesus saves you, you love sin. Yes, it might not be outward because you are afraid if people find out they will start looking down on you. So most of your sin is, as it were, underneath there, under the radar, where nobody can see you, but you love your sin. When Jesus saves you, you hate the sins you once loved. And you now become a lover of righteousness. And that's what John does in those verses. He uses argument after argument to try and see, make us reach that point where we will never compromise on this issue. So that if we know that we still love sin and still live in sin, we can go to Jesus Christ again and really plead with him that he might do a real saving work in our hearts. When we come to verse 11 downwards, John clearly changes gears. He goes 
from the, the moral test and he now comes to the love test. The love test. And as is the custom of John, he, he sort of repeats himself and then adds this little extra. And this little extra always tells us what is the new thing on his mind. So if we go back to, to chapter 3 verse 10, you will notice what he was repeating. And what he was repeating was this. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. And then here is the addition. No is the one who does not love his brother. So he, he stretches it. And immediately you begin to see that that's where his mind is shifting. That's the way John writes. It's, he writes in circles, but in every new circle, there's something new. And that something new is what we need to seriously think about. And now, the something new is the test, and it is that of love. And all he's saying is this, that if you find that you have a special love for believers, if you find you've got a special love for believers, then most likely Jesus has saved you. He's done so. He's done something in you that has made the people in whom he has done something special to you. The opposite is equally true. If your attitude towards believers is the same as your attitude towards your schoolmates and classmates. In other words, it's just people who are around you, who are convenient for you. Yes, you relate to them because you are within the same four walls. But as soon as you've knocked off and you've gone, well, it's your own life and their life is theirs. Well, if that's you, then you're not a Christian. That's what he's saying. That he's never saved you. You are still in your sins. You are still lost. You are still on your way to hell. That's what John is doing in this passage of scripture. And what I want us to notice as we begin to look at this is that love for believers is a test that John uses again and again. He emphasizes it over and over again. And the reason why I want us to notice this is because it immediately makes us realize that it is a major test. It's a test we dare not fail. It's a test where we should look at the checklist and the moment we see the box, we should tick on it because we know know for sure this one we have passed. Now already in chapter 2 and verse 7 John had dealt with it. Let's go to chapter 2 and verse 7. Chapter 2 and verse 7. This is what he says. beginning with verse 7 all the way to verse 11. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have heard since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him, and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. In other words, this new command, its reality is already evident in you, in whom God has done a work of grace. And what is that? Verse 9. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. And anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light 
and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. He's already dealt with this subject and has dealt with it in terms of interpersonal grudges where within the context of the body of Christ you are going around with a chip on your shoulders you hate that brother you hate that sister and he is saying well if that's true about you you are not a Christian period and then of course we come to chapter 3 where he opens this chapter, this issue up a little more. And apart from the statement we are looking at together in verse 11, John goes further to urge us not to be like Cain, who for selfish reasons sacrificed his brother. Now most of you will remember the story. We'll deal with it next week. And it is where, you know, Cain, out of pure jealousy, his brother Abel was making progress, which he wasn't making. His brother Abel was being accepted by God. He was not being accepted by God. And consequently, he just could not stand it. And he murdered his brother so that he could no longer have this competition around him. And John is saying, don't be like him. We've already read that passage in verse 12 and verse 13. He also goes further to link love with possessing or not possessing eternal life. Again, we have already read that in verse 14 and verse 15. He says that we know that we've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who, love, who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and here it is. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So he connects these two together. If you are going around with hatred, then you are a murderer. A murderer in your heart. And if you're a murderer in your heart, then you don't have eternal life. Instead, you go about with death. In verse 16 to verse 18, John proceeds to argue for love that is practical and not merely emotional. And that's important because it's very easy for us to justify ourselves with a kind of theoretical view that I, I love the brethren simply because in your heart you, you feel some warmth about being around believers. And John is saying that's not what I mean. Quickly, verse 16 to verse 18. He says that this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The point being made there is we can all say I love you. We can all do that. But one of the ways in which love is proved is in the bank account. That's where it's proved. When money moves out of a bank account in order to reduce the suffering of others. If that doesn't happen, we better put a big question mark. Because we can all say we love one another and not look at the needs that are screaming back in our faces. And then from there, John deals with a number of issues. He, 
He deals with the need for us to have peace within our hearts. He also deals with the need for us to beware of false teachers. And after he deals with all those, he comes back to the subject of love as a test of salvation. We see this in verse 7 of chapter 4. Verse 7 of chapter 4. And there he relates having love with the new birth and also having love with a true knowledge of God. I want us to read that passage together. He says there, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. There it is, two things. Born of God, that is born again, and knows God, having this knowledge of God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we may live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. He deals with the love one more time and I'll just quickly quote that and then we wrap up at least this disquisition. And that is at the end of chapter 4. End of chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, this command anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Now, friends... You can't read all that over and over and over again and think that the issue of you loving the brethren is under any other business with God. That is one of those least important aspects of being qualified for heaven. You know, when you go for interviews for a job, they normally have two criterias from which they employ you. One are critical qualifications. You must have one, I mean, all of those. If you don't have any of those, you will not get the job. And then there are others that are more to do with preference or simply a bonus or an addition. So there, yes, you may fail to qualify in a few of them, but depending on who the others are competing with you, if you have more boxes checked, then you get the job. Even if in some of the areas you don't score anything. Now the issue I'm trying to put before you here is that love is not in that second category. Well, God would say, well, okay, yeah, yeah he, he may not have really loved the brethren, but it's not too critical. You know, at least he's, he's qualified in these other areas. No, nigisi. Love is in the category which is critical. I mean, almost half of this book is calling us back to this again and again and again. It's saying if you don't love the brethren and yet you are sort of saying, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. God is looking at you and saying, oh, see? How can you love me? You don't see me. And then the people you sit with in the pews, you care nothing about them whatsoever. You're a liar. You 
definitely are not coming into heaven. Forget it. So it becomes an issue that you dare not overlook. It becomes an issue that you sort of put as a question before yourself. You say, if I was to stand before Almighty God, would I honestly say, Lord, you know from my life, I love the brethren. You know. You know. And what we'll be doing clearly will be a journey through these passages of Scripture. Looking at them one by one and seeking to see how they really reflect on our individual lives. Whether we can honestly say we love the brethren. Now for today, all I want us to do is to, to look at the, that opening statement that, that uh, John provides us. Verse 11. Where he says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. The point that he is making there is that loving one another in the family of God has always been God's injunction to believers. It's at the most basic and elementary level. And that's why he says that this is a message we have heard from the beginning. And what is that beginning? Clearly, it is from the time these people first heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not an extra that was added afterwards. It was at the very beginning when they first received the word of God. One of the aspects of that message was that God wanted them to love other believers. Now, there are other aspects of the Christian life that we don't get within the ABC of our salvation. There are certain aspects, certain truths that we begin to realize as we soldier on in the Christian faith. But this one, is one that we meet at the very start of the Christian life. And it is because it is in the very interest of God that when people repent from sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they should be initiated into these what I call colonies of faith, these little groups of people they are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are to covenant together with the people of God. And when they covenant together, they are both privileges and responsibilities that are in that corporate body. It's of the essence of salvation. You don't get saved and you simply continue swimming around, jumping from church to church like a, like a monkey from one branch of a tree to another without commitment. That is not part of biblical Christianity. God demands that those who repent believe and those who believe are baptized. And when they are baptized, they join the body of God's people and they must begin to be responsible members there. And clearly responsibility involves them taking care of one another, loving others, being interested in others. When the Lord Jesus Christ was about to be crucified, he gathered his disciples together in an upper room. And it's a series of messages we've been studying during the Lord's Supper. And while he was with them in the upper room, he almost caused them to have a heart attack. Because he took off his outer garment, got a towel, put it around his waist, 
got a dish of water and knelt down and began to wash the disciples' feet. They, they couldn't stomach it because it's the lowest of the lowest of the lowest responsibilities of the lowest slave in a household to wash the dirty, stinking feet of travelers in the household. And for the master to do it, they couldn't take it, especially Peter, who was very vocal. He immediately said, no, sorry, I'm not accepting you washing my feet. His entire person revolted against the thought that my master should be cleaning these stinking feet of mine. Jesus said to him, let me do it. You'll understand later why I'm doing this. And when he finished, he took the towel, put aside, put back his outer garment, sat down, and basically said to them, what I have done for you, you must do for one another. You must. You call me teacher, you are right, but look at what I've done. I've done the most basic manual work for you to give you some sense of comfort and relief as you're sitting here in a physical way. You must never think that you are beyond that for one another. And then he went on to say to them in verse 34 and verse 35, maybe let us quickly turn there, uh, John 13 34 and 35. This was after washing their dirty, stinking feet. John 13, 34 and 35. He says there, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's really what he meant by that action. He was not saying you must do this with your teeth clen clenched, and in your heart, you are insulting the person you are doing this for. No, no, no. This is to be an outflow of your love. It's, it's, it's a practical way in which you are expressing your love for the, the brethren. They are not comfortable. You provide them that comfort. They are irritated and frustrated by something. You deliberately take that away. You are showing them you love them. So clearly, the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned that he was leaving his disciples behind and he was leaving them in a world that would not care for them, a world that would hate them, a world that would seek to destroy them altogether because of their faith in him. And he's saying to them that I'm leaving you with one another. That's what I'm doing. I'm not leaving you standing alone. I'm leaving you in the company of one another. That you might find strength and comfort and inspiration and help and practical love from one another. Love one another. Even if it demands you doing the, the, a work that is of, of the lowest servant if your brother or sister needs it, do it. That's right at the beginning. Jesus is about to unleash upon the world the New Testament church. And this is what he's saying to them. Love one another. And even when you go back to the Old Testament, again you see that it is of the very essence of true religion. Love for one another. I don't know how many of you have realized that, in fact, what we call the Ten Commandments, that they were given at the beginning of a nation. 
a nation was about to start. And consequently, God was about to give them a lot of laws, a lot of laws. But prior to giving them a lot of laws, he, he gives them a preamble. He gives them, like in our constitutions around the world now, it's popular to put what they call the Bill of Rights right at the beginning. It, it sort of encapsulates why you will have so many laws afterwards. There are a few that are put there that you, they, they, they provide a sense of direction for the rest of the commands. That's what the Ten Commandments are. They don't stick out on their own. They are a preamble before all the other commands that you read about in Exodus 20 onwards. And those first ten can be divided into two clean camps of five each. The first five have to do with love for God. And the next five have to do with love for neighbor. In other words, you can sum all the ten commandments in one word, love. Period. If you love God... These are the five things you will do. If you love your neighbor, these are the five things you will do. Now, I know some people divide them in terms of four and six, but I obviously differ with that. It's five versus five. And the reason why they divide them that way is because uh, there is a command about uh, honoring your father and your mother, and they always put it among the neighbors. And I always answer that your father and your mother, they are not your neighbors. Eh? They are over you. You look up. So they belong to the first category, which has to do with looking up. The only difference is now, you are looking up to those whom you see, and the proof that you respect the one you don't see is that you are respecting the ones you see who are over you. That's the argument I put. So it's five and five. Now, a, a, a simple test, and I know almost all of you will fail this test. Immediately after the Ten Commandments, God begins to give a lot of commandments, a lot of them. The first category after the Ten Commandments is about what? What are the laws is giving them immediately after the Ten Commandments? I won't want to embarrass you. I'll give you the answer. It's about slaves. Slaves who are among you. And slaves are the people who have no rights whatsoever. No rights. They've got no trade unions. They are not the servants with a minimum wage set by the government. No, no, no. They've sold every right of theirs. And now they live with you. They serve you. And the first category that God begins to deal with are the slaves. And he's saying, this is the way you should treat them. In other words, this is the way you should love them. The ones who've got no rights when they are with you. This is the way you should love them. In other words, clearly, even when God is beginning this new nation, immediately after the Bill of Rights is putting there, immediately his attention is to do with love, practical love, for the least lovable, the slaves. It's in the very nature of God to show that true, love, true religion is about love. It's about love. And therefore, brethren, you need to come to terms with this fact. That the issue of love is elementary stuff. Elementary. If you don't love, you're not going to heaven. Simple. If your life is about yourself, it's all about selfishness, it's all about what I'm going to get, where am I going to have fun today, so that I can enjoy myself and acquire this and acquire that and, and push this one out of the way so that I can get higher. If that's your life, you don't care about the people around about you. 
let me tell you where that is leading you to hell it's not leading you to heaven it's not now very quickly the love that is being spoken about here as a test of salvation is a love for believers it's a love for believers john back to our text john puts it this way for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that you should love one another you should love one another now the word used for love there is the word agape and strictly speaking if he did not add for one another this word agape is not restricted to the family of god it is a principled love. That's what it is. It's a principled love. It's, it's a love that says, this is my responsibility. It, it's not a love that people win because they are nice to you. No. It's a love that goes out because this is who I am before God. This is who I am. I am like God in this aspect. And this others have referred to agape as the God kind of love. The God kind of love. It's the love that God expressed to us while we were still in sin. And you know what that means. We were in rebellion. We were unlovable. And what does God do? We've read it already in First John. He sends his son. To die for us. That's what agape is. In other words, the word that he's using here is a, a, a love which you, you cannot give an excuse for. You can't say no, but God, you know, the reason why I, 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 I couldn't love that chap, you know, he, he, he insulted me. You, 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 you can't use agape in that sentence. You can't. Because agape is a love that loves those who have insulted you. Who've trampled over you. Who've cleaned their dirty shoes over you. That's what agape is. But this love now is being focused upon one another. And the moment that one another subject or phrase comes in, it is talking about the family of God. It is talking about this covenant relationship that you have entered into. So you express love to others because at this time, they are the ones in need and when the bucket comes round and it is you who is now in need, they will also love you back. That's what it is. It is a love for one another. Now, sometimes the word one another is a bit misleading because it almost looks like, you know, it's, it's a love that is just pouring, you know, it's going this way and others are also giving it back to you and so it's, it's sort of one another. When really it's, it's, it ought to read one to another. In other words, today it's you who's in need and I respond in loving you. Next year, it's me who's in need and you respond in loving me. That's what love one another is. Let me make this point this way. Often in churches, people have difficult situations. Maybe they've had a funeral like has happened with the Kabambas. And uh, you find that people complain. They will say, no, there's no love in this church. You know, I had a funeral, I had a sickness, or something happened, you know, I needed money. And, and nobody, nobody came to me. Nobody, they would often say. There's no love in this church. And we hear as elders those complaints from time to time. But there's always a very easy test you can go through. And it's the test of going to the deacon's announcements 
and pulling out the last five funerals, pulling out the last five hospitalizations, and then maybe even pulling out the last five new babies. Just five of each. And then you go to that person who's saying there's no love in the church, and you say to the person, tick the boxes. And you'll notice they'll go, uh, yeah, you know, the last few months have been very busy, very busy, conchito, very busy. So these funerals, no, I just didn't have time. These sicknesses, yeah, I remember hearing the announcements, but yeah, very busy. We're very busy. Okay, at least one. I, I managed to, to visit this one. Yeah, but yeah, these newborn babies, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was very busy, very busy, very busy. So the question is, okay, now, when the other people are also now very busy, why are you complaining? Because they are now also very busy. But the way church life is, I want to assure you, is this. That if when the last five had funerals, you found time to be with them, to take time to visit, counsel with, comfort. When your turn comes and you've got your funeral, you can be sure they'll be falling over each other to come to you. In other words, you have loved them. When the bucket comes round, they will love you back. That's the loving one another. Similarly, when you've got a close relative who's hospitalized, well, the people who had close relatives and were hospitalized and you rushed there, they will also rush over to do the same for you. That's the love of one another that is being spoken about here. And you'll find that to be very true. That often the complaints come from people who see church as a place where I will receive and I will receive and I will receive, but I'm not receiving. They don't see the church as a place where I invest, I invest, I invest in other people's lives, and when my turn comes, the returns come my way. John here is saying there's an all important test, and it is whether you love others when you have a good season. Do you? And thankfully, this is not a kind of test that we need to guess about because we are members of churches if we are serious Christians. We are. And churches have membership lists. And you are able to hear announcements. Even today, I'm sure you heard an announcement of a family in need. A death that has just happened over this weekend. I can fully well assure you, some of you in your hearts, you immediately said, okay, next item, please. Not interested. Next item. Others here went, oh, no. Oh, no. And the mind, like a computer, began to run. When can I quickly go and visit? That immediately is a very practical issue. So the question is, do you love others here? Do you love others here? Not those who are already your friends. You, 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 you've been friends for some time out there long ago. And it just so happens you're now in the same church. And consequently, when you hear something has happened to the brother or sister, of course you are affected and you want to do something. No, it is the one another. I have become a co-signatory to a covenant. We belong together. We are marching to heaven together. Do I love others who are here? Oh, brethren, that's the long journey that we are about to undertake as we go through this passage. It's a passage that will cause us to do some serious heart searching because it's possible to have passed the moral test 
the one from 1 John 3, verse 4 to verse 10. It's possible to have passed the moral test and then to fail this one terribly. And the reason is that it is possible to be outwardly moral. It's possible. Through good Christian upbringing, it is possible for you to tick the right boxes as far as morality is concerned and yet to be spiritually dead. And so John adds another test. And it is the test of love. Look at the brethren around you. Or as you come out of church today, look at the sea of faces that will be out there. And don't look at your old friends. Because your old friends are already friends from long ago. Look at the many others. And then ask yourself the question, do I love? Do I love this one? Am I really interested in this person whom I've been seeing here for a number of weeks now? They've been welcomed in front here. Do I love them? Am I even interested to know where they live? Am I interested to know the circumstances in which they are? Am I? Especially a church like ours that has so many students. Do I know? the critical situation they are in. Maybe right now as I'm speaking, they're in desperate need of school fees. Desperately. Do I care? Do I even know whether they are squatting somewhere because they couldn't go back to their own town because they don't have money? And here they belong to a church where nobody cares, nobody even asks questions, nobody. I know all of us want to say we love. We all want to. But all I'm saying is, let's not be in a hurry because this is such an important test that the last thing we want is to say I love and then on the day of judgment, God should say to you, you did not love the least of these brothers of mine. For when I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was sick. You did not visit me. Angel, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. You don't want it to happen then. So the best thing we should all do during the next season of messages is to say to God, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Search me. Show me the real me so that if I see that I'm not really saved, I may cry to you for salvation now before it is too late. That you may save me now lest I perish in the end. Lord, search me. Amen.